Good morning, everyone. My name is Brett Boykin Roach, and I will be going over the non congregate sheltering overview um, along with Eric Ferguson. Uh, one quick thing I wanted to mention before we begin is this is not for um, emergency sheltering, um, like during a hurricane event. Uh, there's a separate fact sheet about that. This funding is only for non congregate sheltering, specifically for COVID 19. And with that, let us begin. So the non congregate sheltering program was approved April 6th. Uh, it was approved for housing costs uh, for hotels and motels, along with eligible wraparound services that we'll get into in the next slide. Um, the specific individuals that FEMA will reimburse for are those who test positive for COVID-19, those who have been exposed to COVID-19, um, first responders and healthcare workers who are trying to avoid direct contact with their families, and those who are at high risk of getting COVID-19 and need to undertake social distancing as precautionary measures. Um, that last bullet also includes those who can't effectively adhere to social distancing, um, which would be the homeless. Uh, jurisdictions and agencies that are eligible applicants are local health departments, uh, county emergency management, and county department of social services and private nonprofits. Uh, really quickly about private nonprofits. Uh, while they are eligible applicants and doing non congregate sheltering is eligible work, when it comes down to the legal responsibility aspect of FEMA's review, uh, it gets a lot more murky, uh, which is why we strongly encourage any private nonprofit to roll up under the county. Uh, meaning that the private nonprofit provides the services and then either the county is directly paying for the, the those services or they'll reimburse them later on. But basically the county is going to be the actual applicant instead of the private nonprofit. Um, if that does not work for your county, then there still needs to be an MOA uh, in order to avoid any reimbursement issues for that private nonprofit. So the eligible wraparound services are laundry, meals, shelter for pets, transportation to the uh, facility, the hotel or motel, um, disinfecting of rooms, and security. Uh, there are two types of non-congregate shelters. Um, social distancing shelters are for those who are at high risk of COVID-19 and need to undertake social distancing as a precautionary measure. And there's also quarantine and isolation shelters. Um, which are for people who have to quarantine um, because they are positive or they've come in contact with someone who is positive. So all the uh, expenses that we talked up to this point, so the cost for lodging and the wraparound services are 100% reimbursable. 75% um, of that cost share is FEMA, 25% of that is the actual state. Um, if you are going through FEMA or if you're going through the state-centric model, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you still have to send um, weekly reports about your numbers, about how many people are in your shelter, um, what wraparound services you're providing, the average cost, and things of that nature. Uh, there's a link on this actual PowerPoint, which you will receive later. And if you don't have it, please reach out to me or Erica and we can send it to you. Uh, really fast, I'll touch on the state-centric model. Um, it's coming up on the next page. Basically, the state-centric model is an extension of the FEMA program. So we still, the state is going to submit your documentation, um, proof of payments, your invoices, and everything on your behalf. Um, as long as there's a memorandum of understanding and memorandum of agreement in place. Uh, and the way the state central model is, it's going forward from when we sign it. So if you sign it on November 1st, all your costs going forward from that um, can be submitted directly to the state. Any costs before then should be submitted directly to FEMA for reimbursement. Uh, what this basically allows for you to do is get reimbursed a lot faster than you would through FEMA. Instead of having to wait three to six months, you can get paid in less than 20 days as long as everything is in order with direct pay and there's no issues with your documentation. Cool. 
So the process for the state-centric model is we would give you the draft MOA. Uh, you would review it with your legal team. If you had any questions or concerns, we'd go back and forth. Um, someone from your organization would sign it um, and then send it to us. We give it to Sprayberry to sign it. And then going forward from that, you guys would be set up in the state-centric model. Uh, so you have to set up direct pay with OCS, OSC, sorry. There's more detailed information about that on our FAQ and our guidance document. Um, you have to pay the vendor um, and then you send the invoices, supporting documentation and proof of payment either bi-weekly or monthly. Um, and after that, we ver verify the costs and then send it to DPS for payment. And then later on, we will seek reimbursement. Uh, the main difference between this one is instead of you guys directly going to FEMA, again, the state is doing it on your behalf, um, which will greatly speed up the time that it takes for you guys to get paid, which is good. So non congregate shelters are run at the county level and counties may decide the best way to run a local program. Uh, so these are just ways currently that it's, it's being operated um, and run. <clears throat> we realize that based on where your county is and level of resources that things can be run a little bit differently. Um, so the first one is obviously the local office of emergency management or local health department is the primary applicant. Um, they run the site and they're in charge of everything. Um, another model that we, we see and I see this a lot is uh, an eligible nonprofit is the applicant and establishes the non congregate shelter site and has an MOU with the county. Um, and this go back, goes back to what we talked about before about uh, making sure that there is some kind of agreement in place so they can uh, set up that legal responsibility. And finally, we have regional partners. Um, if you're not able to set up a, a site and there's no one in your area that could, uh, you might want to look at regional partners. Uh, one that comes to mind immediately is Trillium. Uh, they're an LMEMCO who operate in multiple counties. Um, also, reach out to other counties near yours um, to see if there could be some kind of partnership uh, set up to kind of uh, centralize people and, and combine resources. Again, we highly encourage local efforts to coordinate closely with other partners. Um, so again, based on where you are and what kind of resources you have, uh, you, you may have to go through more organizations or, or do more uh, to be able to provide a non-congregate shelter and program. Um, if you need help either finding a hotel or motel, or if you need help um, finding wraparound services or anything of that nature, uh, please reach out to me or Erica and we can help facilitate that. Uh, just a quick example. So the city of Asheville has a very well-run um, non-congregate sheltering program. Uh, their day-to-day -day operations are run by a private nonprofit. Um, they have security. Um, they have meals delivered. Um, they also have uh, telehealth consults and a PRN on site along with via health for behavioral health support. Uh, one thing that they do that I, I think is a good idea more counties should have is uh, they have a participation agreement um, to enforce social distancing expectations and outline the property damage implications, et cetera. Um, and that is about it. So I will turn it over to Erica. Hello, thank you, Brett. And just a um, just a reminder that any questions, I know that we have a lot of different participants, which is great to see in the um, names and organizations in the chat, but feel free to also include any questions in the chat um, that we can answer throughout, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, but this is a map of our non-congregate uh, sheltering that we have set up to date based on our uh, weekly reporting that we receive. Um, these reports are on the website and we ask, um, well, it's required that anyone who's receiving FEMA, expecting any reimbursement from the state and FEMA to fill this out weekly. Um, and it is, in, it is in, 
encouraged that even those who have set it up and don't expect reimbursement um, are using other funding for this purpose um, also submit um, so that we can have a full um, resource list or, or, or know of all non congregate shelters that are currently provided across the state. So you can see um, those in green have uh, sheltering solutions for both types of shelters that Brett mentioned, including the quarantine and isolation um, and social distancing. Um, some have, uh, some counties have um, shelters set up for quarantine and isolation only. Some um, only have it available for social distancing and an example of a social distancing shelter um, or, the, or the use case for such a shelter um, is different from a lot of county in a lot of different counties, but many counties are using it as, an op as a way to reduce their congregate shelter uh, populations in homeless shelters or domestic violence shelters, for example. Um, and some are using it for other populations as well, um, uh, our, our farm workers or others. Um, so that is a, another option um, where they move their most high risk, according to CDC guidelines, into a non-congregate sheltering option, a hotel motel, um, in order to reduce the shelter population for those at, at less risk within the congregate setting. So that is something that has worked in partnership with our homeless service providers um, and other uh, partners in the community. Um, and then the isolation and quarantine, of course, is is critical for those who, um, to serve those who can't safely isolate and quarantine at home and we've seen this and have approval for folks who are healthcare workers, um, other essential workers who need to quarantine, those who um, uh, are infected with COVID or have to quarantine or expose to uh, COVID um, that can't safely do so at home if they're, if they're doubled up or a crowded household or otherwise, or uh, folks who live in um, congregate housing, uh, farm workers or homeless um, populations or others. So there's a, a lot of different types of folks who might use either an isolation quarantine shelter or a social distancing shelter. Um, so we currently have coverage or some sort of coverage in 67 of our counties um, and um, we don't have coverage, at least reported coverage in uh, 33 of our, of our counties. Um, we do know that some of these counties do have other, uh, do have isolation and quarantine plans um, set up and um, we will have a survey coming later um, to get following this with the recording of this webinar to get a little bit more information on some of those plans um, that, that we can share with partners when asked. If you go to the next slide. Um, there are, if, for uh, folks who need access to non congregate shelter, we have a few different ways in which we publish um, the different options. We don't, for safety reasons, um, typically share the, the name or location of the shelter. Um, we just post the, um, the county and the access point contact information. So in some counties, that is someone at emergency management or at the local health department. Um, sometimes they, depending on the size of the shelter um, and the number of people they're serving, they have staff on site at that shelter location, that hotel motel in most cases. Um, so those access points look uh, very different depending on how the county set it up, but we list those on our website, on the non-congregate sheltering website um, and update that every week based on the reporting that we receive that week. Um, for counties that we don't have access points, we usually, when asked um, for, we usually um, refer folks to their local health department or emergency management contacts to um, learn of other potential solutions in their county. And then 211 also has the updated list um, of our access points for non-congregate shelter across the state. Um, and they have that the, um, nowhere to find that updated list as well of access points. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, it is of particular concern um, or of interest of the state as we think about our, our farm workers and our growers and how we can support them in non-congregate sheltering. Um, we, of course, are, are working with lots of different populations for this, um, but, but one, especially as we are in now a new growing season out west, um, it, um, making sure that we have, and many of our 
migrant farm workers and others live on site at, at, at farms and often in congregate settings and making sure that um, we can uh, support our growers and, and our farm workers to make sure that they have access to these arrangements as well. Uh, so we encourage that growers work with their county to identify um, either at themselves uh, available um, housing in a nearby area where folks can either isolate and quarantine if needed or provide additional social distancing. Um, and there's some suggestions here on how to do that. And then um, also another option is to look and utilize the non-congregate sheltering access list that we uh, publish on our website and follow those steps. We have information for particular for farm workers as well as other populations and different fact sheets on our website for more detail on how uh, to support farm workers and growers as well as our homeless populations as well as all other populations that have access to non-congregate sheltering. If you go to the next slide. Um, and we, we do know that non-congregate sheltering is um, not always um, either available in a county um, or um, or the there could be other solutions. So um, we do have guidelines from the CDC um, as well as other guidelines that are on our website on how to um, keep someone safe within um, within their homes or their shelter situations. Make sure that we that you keep high risk individuals. Um, separated from those who are sick, um, follow, continue to follow the six uh, feet minimum rule um, with our three W's um, or, or further, make sure to provide a separate bedroom and bathroom for the individual who is sick. And if separate rooms are not possible, ensure that there's good airflow, social distancing and, and cleaning and disinfected. Um, to limit exposure, have only one person in the household take care of the individual who is sick and ensure that the sick individual does not help prepare food and eat separately from the family during um, their isolation. So these are some uh, guidelines for, for folks who are quarantining or isolating at home. Um, but in situations where these uh, guidelines are not um, available, either in a shelter situation or um, in a home, um, we hope to work with counties to make sure that there is an option to isolate and quarantine in non-congregate shelter environments. If you go to the next slide, there are some, this is some uh, follow-ups on um, that we will be providing. Um, we will be sending a survey after this presentation um, that is asking a a number of questions. We know we've heard um, anecdotally um, and from working with many different counties that they have set up non-congregate sheltering and are funding it in a different way than FEMA reimbursement, which is totally fine. Um, so we're trying to collect some of that information to make sure that we are aware of all of the non-congregate sheltering options statewide that might not be reported to us every week, um, like those that are seeking reimbursement are. Um, we are also are trying to understand barriers um, that counties are facing um, with non-congregate sheltering, whether it is they can't find a hotel or motel room that's available. Um, I know many Western counties, it's prime leaf peeping season and soon ski season, and they're having those issues out east, had similar issues um, in the summer and, and continue to. And we know many of our rural uh, counties don't have as many hotels to choose from. So um, we understand all those barriers. Some are finding partners to offer wraparound services um, and, and some just need uh, additional support and questions asked on FEMA reimbursement and what in the world is the state-centric model and things like that. So um, our emails, Brett and my email are here. If you have any questions like that, we're happy to help. We also have these non-congregate sheltering fact sheets and frequently asked questions linked directly here on the slide, but all of this information can be found on um, on the non-congregate sheltering website. Um, that is, I believe, uh, the end of the survey. So we are asked, or the webinar, we are asking that we'll send the survey um, quickly after. Um, later today, you'll receive the re webinar recording as well as the survey, and we would um, love for you to turn that around by Wednesday, November 4th, 
Um, I feel like that's my Oscar music to stop talking. Um, uh, and then we are, are happy to answer any questions that we have in the chat. I see that one question most recently was the non-congregate sheltering waiver. Um, so that is something um, that we have to apply for every month from FEMA to get um, re-approved. And that happens, Brett or Todd, uh, uh, I think we get that toward the end of each month, um, the renewal. But um, we, we often, our renewal from FEMA happens right at that deadline. And we expect just for county planning, um, for as long as we have um, a need for non-congregate shelter and active um, and um, kind of increasing case counts and things, we will continue to be um, asking FEMA for the non-congregate sheltering waiver and approval. Um, and we foresee that at least for the next few months. So we will continue to ask um, for that waiver. And we have um, to date received no um, information from FEMA that, that will, this program will be ending um, in the near term. So um, we will continue to keep you updated. We upload all of the approval letters to the Non-Congregate Sheltering website um, so that you have those for your records or for your understanding. But we uh, plan to continue to the program as long as there is a need, which for the foreseeable future there will be. Um, I can go through the questions or, or Brett or Todd, I don't know if you've seen any that we should uh, go through first or. Yeah, so there was, um, there's one about what's the minimum threshold. Uh, so if you're gonna apply directly to FEMA, the minimum threshold I think is 3,300. Uh, if you're doing the state centric model, there's not a minimum threshold. Um, and I think the, the next question I see is, can you send out the form for isolation data? Um, that was from Abby. I'm not not exactly sure what you mean. Could you rephrase your question, please? Um, I think. And then for Leslie, uh, so in the in the actual contracts with your um, vendor, you have to have a. Uh, convenience clause basically saying that you could cancel it at any time. Um, so if that's not in there, FEMA's not gonna approve for it anyway. But yeah, it is. it does make it difficult to have longer term contracts. And hey, Brett, if I could just, um, can, I, can I jump in real quick just to kind of clarify that a little bit? Yeah. Yep, yeah, so, um, you know, we understood that we need to have that 30 day clause we that is uh, certainly one thing that's keeping us from being able to get into contracts with some hotels because they want you know if they're going to have to boot people out for us to be able to come in then um you know they want to know that that they're they're going to receive some type of of income kind of on a monthly basis so that, that we make it worth their while i guess my question regarding the non-congregate shelter waiver and erica that was really good information that it goes kind of on a month by month basis is what happens if come December, the non-congregate shelter waiver, FEMA says, nope, we're not gonna do it anymore. We've got a vaccine out. You know, we're, we're calling this, you know, mitigation strategy underway. Um, and we still can't put people back into their normal congregate sheltering situations. Kind of what's, I, I guess that's our concern is that there's gonna be this gap in time where there's no longer a non-congregate shelter waiver, but we still, for the health of the public have to um, continue on with non-congregate sheltering. Um, I think that's a really good question. I, I think we anticipate, although we do not have direct confirmation of this, to my knowledge, Todd or Brett definitely jump in, that we would have some sort of communication from FEMA um, giving us a little bit of a runway on when the program will be ramping down so that it won't be, um, so that we can plan accordingly um, with, in partnership with um, our, the counties and organizations who are running these um, and can, can work on thinking of, of alternative 
um, options for when that does happen. We haven't received, um, to my knowledge, and, and Todd and Brett definitely jump in any um, understanding that that will that will be ending soon. Um, to be thinking about this plan B, but definitely would um, want to start thinking about that. I know that some or uh, some counties are looking at um, the temporary congregate shelters um, and or um, the disaster shelters under um, ability in partnership with the county. Um, so there are some congregate sheltering options that are not ideal compared to non-congregate shelters that could be an option. We can provide more guidance on, on those options too as a um, for when non-congregate sheltering might end, but we have no guidance about that at this point. Sorry, that was a longer answer. <laughs> Ted, Todd, or, or Brett, or others, if anything I missed. Uh, no, um, same kind of idea. We don't necessarily know, but we do expect FEMA to give us some kind of leeway uh, towards the end of the program so that people can be prepared for it. But like Erica said, they haven't let us know or talked to us about that at all. Um, I guess the next question is Kent. Um, using the state centric model, do we work through our area coordinator for su submission of expenses? Uh, so, for the state centric model and all the, the FAQ, the guidance document for that, and everything is on this PowerPoint, which you guys will get at the end, or will be posted at the end, I'm sorry. Um, so you actually send your expenses and everything to me, because uh, I have to approve them first, and then it gets sent to DPS. Um, is there a standard participant agreement? If not, would Asheville Blue Ring will share yours? So we don't have one. Um, I'm sure Asheville would, would be willing to share theirs. Um, I can talk to them and confirm, but I don't think that would be an issue. Yep, and Brian, thank you, Brian. <laughs> Brian would be happy to share. Could you all just talk, this is Kate, sorry. Um, could you all talk a little bit about, you know, what this might look like? I know for one county, it, it could be one model, but how this model could potentially work for multiple counties, um, you know, working together jointly uh, and how that could, could benefit through the state-centric model. Sure, I can I can jump in. I think there's a few options for them. Um, it is um, it is important to ensure reimbursement to I think the two things when setting up a shelter to to make sure to check the box and, and Brett is the one who knows uh, who um, can provide. Uh, more advice on this is to make sure that there is a demonstrated public health need, um, of course, in most counties with the current case counts and things that is um, clear and, and having some sort of documentation of that is, is also helpful um, to have either from the health department or, um, or otherwise. Um, and then also um, just able to show that this is the, um, the best option financially. So um, getting, uh, reserving all of the rooms in a 200 room hotel um, for an isolation quarantine shelter to meet the needs of one smaller county is probably not the best option for, um, for that county. Um, so those are the kind of the two uh, threshold questions to consider. Um, in your options, we do have some counties that are working in part partnership or in regional models. Um, we have, so it can look different for different counties. We have one county that has a few shelters set up that has an agreement um, with a neighboring county that they can isolate and quarantine using their hotel rooms um, in, in, in that county. So that's a 
Um, I'm not entirely sure if that is a MOA or other sort of agreement that they have between counties, um, and and that is um, that is effective um, and works for them. So we know that a lot of our it is impractical for each and every one of our counties to set up their own hotel or motel. Some counties don't have that option. Um, so uh, partnerships across counties or regions um, is is definitely encouraged um, and we can help think through the exact arrangement if, if that is necessary. Um, and then we also have some regional um, approaches. So uh, Brett mentioned one out east with, with Trillium who has um, is serving folks across their whole catchment area in the, in the east um, and they have um, an agreement with the state directly to do that, um, but other regional providers could have kind of agreements with each of each of the counties that they're serving. So there's a few different options um, on how to do that. Are there any other any other questions? If easier, um, folks can take themselves on mute, off mute, and, and voice their question. If easier, but um, also the chat is is fine. Hey, this is Lisa Bennett. I have a quick question, please. Are you? able to record this for those who either couldn't attend or had some internet issues? Yes. Could you record this? That would be super great. Yes, we are, we are recording this um, presentation and we will be sending it out um, after the, uh, later this, later today to all folks who joined um, or to all folks who are on the invite list, all emergency management, local health departments, definitely. Um, Feel free to forward it to other community partners that we might not have on the distribution list. Oh, and, and uh, social services and others. Um, so we will be sending that out definitely um, along with the survey that we do ask all counties, regardless of a, if you currently have uh, non congregate sheltering set up um, with FEMA reimbursement, without FEMA reimbursement, or don't have um, non congregate sheltering or a similar solution set up, if you could just uh, fill out that survey uh, by next Wednesday, that would help in our planning um, and uh, help in ways that we can uh, better support counties. Wonderful, thank you. Are there any other questions? Are there any? This is. Um, are there any recommendations, um, either from Eric or Erica, sorry, or Brett or anyone else on what to do when you cannot find hotels that will simply rent you? one or two rooms or a block of rooms for COVID positive individuals um, where they just, it doesn't matter who you get to talk to them, to the hotel owners or management, they just, they will not do it. They will not allow you uh, to rent a room for a potentially COVID positive. I know that we don't have to reveal that it's a COVID positive, but we also want to do the right thing for our community um, and let them know what's happening has any, Erica and Brett, have you guys heard about this? Do you have any workarounds or any ways to help us uh, so that we don't necessarily have to rent out an entire hotel to take care of um, isolation and quarantine? Um, I, Brett, Brett might have additional um, thoughts, ideas from his work with counties on this issue. I know that some have looked at um, not necessarily hotels and motels, but things that are similar um, uh, that you can rent that are like a 
kind of Airbnb or a house or a group home or other things that are still able to be rented in the same way. There are some issues with actually buying a, a trailer, things that aren't reimbursable, but things that are, are, are similar to hotels and motels on a smaller scale. Um, I would make sure to questions about that just for clarity uh, check with Brett or um, first, but that is an option that some counties have explored in those issues, um, um, in those situations and other issues would be um, more of a regional approach if if, if there aren't kind of Airbnbs or, Airbnbs or, or other kind of units or things. Um, some people are using conference centers or, or other places that have um, rooming options on them that might be closed due to COVID. Um, but that's a, 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 a regional option might be a good um, idea where many counties are using kind of the same hotel. Obviously that increases transportation um, needs, um, but that is reimbursable um, as well. Um, so those are, are some of the options, but happy to help think through it um, directly. Brett, I don't know or, or if you have um, from experience working with other counties more to add there. Um, no, um, unfortunately that is something that has happened a lot and kind of like you said, just being creative, exploring other options. Mm -hmm. And also, like you said, working with other facilities or other counties and things to have a more regional approach for it is all we've been able to do so far. And this is Kate. Um, I, I work with the North Carolina Farm Worker Health Program. And I've been, you know, looking into some things that other states have been doing. Um, and of course, not everything can be applied in North Carolina. But I think it's always interesting to, to see different ideas of what other folks are doing, how they're collaborating. So I can put my email in the chat if anyone wants to reach out and just see kind of some things that are being done in other places. Um, you know, I'm happy to share that. So I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and if anyone wants to reach out to see, again, some other creative things that are being done in other states and how local communities are working together, whether it's a regional approach or whether it's you know a specific county, um, I'm happy to share that and connect folks with, with, with other people just so that they can continue that discussion. Thanks, Kate. Um, and then there was a question about where the survey can be found. Um, I will put the um, survey in the chat um, that we, but we will send it out in an email to everyone following uh, with the web recording. So if you don't get it in the in the chat, it will be coming soon. Any other questions? Todd or Brett, any kind of closing thoughts? Um, just thank you everybody for coming. And if you guys have any questions, please, like we said, feel free to reach out to either me or Erica. Um, especially when it comes to trying to find things in your area if there's nothing available. Great, thank you all so much. We'll be sending, you'll receive it an email soon with uh, this presentation, the resources and, and the survey. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody.